today we are continuing our replay series, and this is a message that I gave during our 21 days of prayer. It is our second to last teaching. Next week, I'm going to be posting the finale for the 21 days of prayer, featuring both myself and the pastor from City Hope Church, Noah Fricci. Uh, we're really looking forward to that, but in the meantime, I will be speaking in this video about personal vision. What does God want you to do in his church? Good morning. How are you guys doing today? Good. We have some morning people in the crowd. Everyone that's more like me went, no. No, not good. Today, we're talking about vision. Vision. And now, we already talked about vision, right? We talked about our community vision, our church vision. I kind of have a theory about vision, if you'll indulge me. I think there's kind of three levels. I could argue for four levels, but we'll say three. There's three levels of it. There's the big C church mission, what you've heard called the great commission, right? Go and make disciples and baptize them and teach them all the things that I have taught you. Some variation of that. Every gospel actually has its own record of the Great Commission, worded slightly differently, with a slightly different emphasis, and Acts has one, too. So there's five different records of the Great Commission. That's the big C church mission. That's what all of us do. Then there's the little c church mission, right? We each have a slightly different one, slightly different emphasis. There's a church that I worked at up north a ways in Wisconsin. Their mission was to make it easy to find and experience God. That fits within the Great Commission, right? Brian has both a vision and a mission statement. We've talked a little bit about both of them, right? To give healing for yesterday through Jesus, to give healing for yesterday, help for today, hope for tomorrow. And here at City Hope, you guys have a three-pillar emphasis as your mission statement to find the lost, save the lost, bring them hope, and change the city, right? And we've talked about these a little bit. That's the, the big, or the little C church mission. It fits under the umbrella of the Great Commission, but they're a little bit unique to each situation. Each church has a slightly different emphasis, a different piece of the mission that it takes and owns as its own. Now that leaves the third layer, the individual vision, the individual mission. What do each of us do to contribute to our congregation and to the big C church? And more importantly, how do we determine what our role is supposed to be? Uh, I'm kind of a nerd. I said that last time that I was up here. So I've actually taken the time to go through a bunch of different recommended personal vision strategy things that have been uh, recommended to me by mentors and by books that I've read and by lecturers that I've listened to. Uh, and I haven't found one better than the structure in the Bible itself. Did you know the Bible tells us how to find our own vision? This is actually pointed out to me uh, in a book by a guy named Andy Stanley. Anyone familiar with him? It's an amazing preacher. If you haven't heard him, you should look up some of his stuff. But he wrote a book called Visioneering. It sounds like very Disney, right? Like Visioneering. That just sounds like something that Disney would come up with. He follows the prophet Nehemiah as an example of how to develop a godly vision in your life. To see how you fit within your congregation and within God's people. He says that we should distinguish between good ideas and God ideas. In other words, there are plenty of good things that you can devote your life to. But which one does God have for you? So stealing from his idea a little bit, I want to talk about some of the things that Nehemiah does to help us develop our own personal vision, to see where we fit within our congregations and within the universal church. So let's follow the story of Nehemiah just a little bit today. In chapter 1 of Nehemiah, beginning in verse 3, we see these words. They said to me, now wait a minute, who is they? You see, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king, the king of 
Babylon. You see, Israel had been destroyed, and then Judah, the southern country, because Israel had split in half, the southern half of what used to be the unified kingdom, later came under the control of the country of Babylon. And Nehemiah was brought not quite as a slave, but not quite as a full citizen into Babylon and eventually became cupbearer to the king, which is actually a very influential position. So he had found status in Babylon, but a number of his relatives came to him. A number of his people came to him and said, Jerusalem is in ruin. The houses have been destroyed, the walls have been torn down, and there is no temple in the city. Jerusalem is in ruin. And Nehemiah, well, let's see how Nehemiah reacts. These people, he says, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province, that is back in Judah, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. That is our first key, our first step in discovering your own personal vision. What grieves you? What has God placed on your heart? One of the ways Andy Stanley puts it is what keeps you up at night? What could be that should be? Another way I've heard it put is where is your holy discontentedness? Where has God's will not been made manifest in the world and it just hurts your soul? Nehemiah heard of the condition of his home city and he wept over it. The next step we see in just the following verses, Nehemiah's immediate reaction Beginning right where we picked off and moving on. Nehemiah is weeping and then he writes this. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keeps his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to the prayer of your servant before you, who has been praying before you day and night. The people of Israel, I confess the sins of we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, the ones that we have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you, and we have not obeyed your commandments, decrees, and laws, which you gave to your servant Moses. And the prayer goes on. So step two is what? Prayer. Have you spoken to the Lord about it? This thing that grieves your heart. Have you asked the Lord if he wants you to act on it? That sounds like a pretty simple step, doesn't it? How many of you work for somebody? You work for a board or you have. You work for a board, for a boss, for somebody. Some of you are retired, but you still work for your spouse, right? Most of us, I would assume, even though our shoulders are not working today, most of us... Most of us work for somebody. Do you ever ask your boss's permission before you act? Maybe. Sometimes. Right? And if you don't, it's probably because you had prior permission. We go to the person in authority over us and say, do you want me to take care of this? As Christians, who is our boss? Jesus. God. The Holy Spirit. I'll take any of the three. Right? Right? Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, God. God is our boss. So if we have something on our hearts that we feel we should act on, should we just go and do it without consulting him? No. If he's going to open up his throne room to us in prayer, we should go and ask him, would you have me move on this? And he may answer you immediately. He may answer you slowly. He may answer you in that prayer or in scripture or through an individual in your little C congregation, or maybe through a pastor that works at a different church across town. Who knows? But I believe that God will answer. And indeed, he seems to have answered Nehemiah, but maybe not immediately. Because in Nehemiah 1.1, we have this little time marker that's Hebrew and easy to read over. Because in most of our translations, it isn't translated for us. It says that in the month of Kislev, he heard. That's around November or December, right around that transition. Because Jewish people use a lunar calendar instead of the calendar that is used for uh, civic purposes. But in chapter 2 where he gets his answer, where he gets his opportunity to act, it says it is the month of Nisan. 
the same month that Jesus, many centuries later, would be crucified in, around March or April. So he waited how many months? Three, four months of fasting and praying and asking God, God, can I act on this? God, can I help your people? God, can I go to Jerusalem? And he waited three or four months. Some of us, we have to wait three or four years. Some of us, it's only three or four days or three or four hours. Or some of you, God's just waiting for you to take the opportunity here in a moment to ask him and you will get an immediate answer. But some of us, we have to wait. So have you waited patiently? Did you avoid the temptation of hastily leaping into something that the Lord would not have for you? Did you make sure that you had God's blessing? Did you ask other believers? Lastly, have you spotted and taken the opportunity God has provided to you for you to realize God's vision in your life? Nehemiah 2 begins this way. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, he was the cupbearer, remember? So when the wine comes, so does Nehemiah. He was a really fun guy at parties. I took the wine and gave it to the king, and I had not been sad in his presence before. And so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. God gave Nehemiah his opportunity. The king himself, potentially the most powerful man in the world in this period, certainly the most powerful man in the region, looked at him and said, why are you sad and what can I do for you? And Nehemiah replies, I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king li live forever. Why should my face not look sad? For the city of my ancestors is burned and lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. And the king said to me, well, what do you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven. This is a desperate prayer. He goes, God, please give me the words, and then looks up, and he answers. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my ancestors were buried, so that I may rebuild it. And the rest of the book of Nehemiah is him fulfilling that mission with the king's permission and the king's resources. God gave Nehemiah an opportunity. And after fasting and praying, after spending time in community and worshiping the Lord, after making sure this was God's will, recognizing his holy discontentedness, Nehemiah took the opportunity. We're going to transition here in just a moment into a time of personal prayer. And I'm a firm believer, just as the Apostle Paul was, that each one of us has a role in the body to fill. Unfortunately, many of us don't know where it is. So ask those questions. What is it that has grieved my heart? Have I asked the Lord about it? Have I waited for his response and conferred with others? Have I fasted and waited patiently? And lastly, when God has given me an opportunity, am I prepared to act? There's something in God's kingdom that he has laid out for you. Whether it is big or small or somewhere in between. So let's discover today, or begin discovering in our time of prayer, what God's will in our individual lives is. Now, if I could pray for you really quickly before we transition. Lord, I'd ask that you would bless this time of prayer, that you would convict each soul in here of their special place in your kingdom and their special roles. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope that teaching was helpful to you, uh, whether it was the first time you saw it or the second time. Next week, we're going to be continuing this series, actually wrapping up this series and then going back to our regularly scheduled programming, so don't miss it. There are some really cool things that we got to do in the finale, and unfortunately, they won't come across in the cut-down version of it, but I think the teaching is still immensely helpful, so we're looking forward to seeing you back here next week. If you haven't already, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Those kinds of things really help us with our electronic ministry to reach more people.